share just this screen fill her up and put a cute little border on there why not make her own F zero F A F F the Alice Blue Shoot. Shoot. Over there. Cool. We're out of the starting time, we're twenty minutes late anyways, but you know, sometimes that's how it be. Sometimes I can see right through myself sometimes. There. That's better. I almost wonder if I should mess with like virtual desktops, but you know, windows. Uh, what are the odds? That's good. That's good. Scroll you just like that. God, I hope it's free. Panda Don, lurking. Hope we're having a good stream. Sorry, we're. Yeah, Panda, no trouble. We're having the time of our lives. Lurk away. I haven't seen hide nor hair of you in a hot second. I hope things are well. And, uh. <laughs> My apologies if this isn't what you're trying to lurk to. Cause we, we did get a ways into the first chapter last time, so we're going to skip ahead. Ooh. That's not what we wanted to do. That's not what we wanted to do at all. We wanted. Where were we? Oh. Because it's. Yeah. SoundCloud ads. Gotta support the homies. Gotta support the homies. Sonny boy needs that cash. Alright, because there was the myth of the gods. So they're like, hey, rebirth, rebirth. It's all one big cycle, man. We just keep going round and round. Uh, youth Revolt. Like, wait a minute. Those people in the 60s had ideas. And they weren't just radical Marxists. Can I actually turn this? down just a hair so I don't go blind. Cool. Yeah. Uh, do you cheat? Do you know? 
man destroyed this world, man can create this world. from X this way, ever. We'll raise her up so it's a little easier. I hope things are audible. I can't. <laughs> Shoot. Like, every period. It's the Renaissance. There's gotta be a better way to like dark mode it. Like invert the colors. No oh, well. Every period since the Renaissance, like yeah. Science is great. Yeah. What if society was great to match science? I believe we're up to monkeys. because I don't recall all the points that they made. And, uh, to distinguish ecology from the environmentalism and from abstract, often obfuscatory definitions of the term, it must return to its original uses and explore its direct relevance to society. To quite... I don't know why the cursor looks like that. Can I... I just have no cursor. Actually, yeah. Oh. <laughs> that put me all the way to the bottom. That's why we don't recognize any of these words. So there's a rule. That's a uh, inverted? Nope. Mm -hmm. Bookchin wrote so many words. Rank Smith the Gods, Birth, Rebirth. You love to see it. Sixties weren't just a bunch of hippies. I mean, they were, but that's good actually. We have the power to rebuild because we have the power to destroy. To use science because science is good actually. Ah. Uh, okay, I think we'll pick up on this point here. Where the. Choo. The social ecology provides more than a critique of the split between humanity and nature. It also poses the need to heal them, and indeed, it poses the need to radically transcend them. As E.A. Gutkind pointed out, the goal of social ecology is a wholeness, not mere adding together of innumerable details collected at random and interpreted subjectively and insufficiently. The science deals with social and natural relationships in communities, or ecosystems, and conceiving them holistically, that is to say, in terms of their mutual interdependence, social ecology seeks to unravel the forms and patterns of interrelationships that give intelligibility to a community, be it natural or social. A holism, here, is the result of the conscious effort to discern how the particulars of a community are arranged, how its geometry as the Greeks may have put it, makes the whole more than the sum of its parts, hence the, <laughs> hence the wholeness to, what, to which Gutkind refers is not to be mistaken for a spectral oneness, 
that yields cosmic dissolution into a structureless nirvana. It is a richly articulate. It is a richly articulated structure with history and internal logic of its own. History, in fact. History, in fact, is, is as important as form or structure. To a large extent, the history of a phenomenon is the phenomenon itself. We are, in a real sense, everything that existed before us. And in turn, we can eventually become vastly more than we are. Surprisingly, very little in the evolution of life forms has been lost in natural and social evolution. Indeed, in our very bodies, as our embryonic development attests, evolution lies within us, as well as around us, as parts of the very nature of our beings. For the present, it suffices to say that wholeness is not a bleak, undifferentiated universality that involves the reduction of a phenomenon to what it has in common with everything else. Nor is it a celestial, omnipresent energy that replaces the vast material of differentia of which natural and social realms are composed. To the contrary, wholeness comprises the variegated structures, the articulations, and the mediations that impart the whole a rich variety of forms, and thereby add unique qualitative properties to what a strictly analytic mind often reduces to innumerable and random details. Terms like wholeness, totality, and even community have perilous nuances for a generation that has known fascism and other totalitarian ideologies. And the words evoke images of a wholeness achieved through homogenization, standardization, and a repressive coordination of human beings. These fears are reinforced by a wholeness that seems to provide an inexorable finality to the course of human history, one that implies a superhuman, narrowly, narrowly teleological concept of social law and denies the ability of human will and, s and individual choice to shape the course of social events. Such notions of social law and teleology have been used to achieve a ruthless subjugation of the individual to superhuman forces beyond human control. Our century has been afflicted by a plethora of totalitarian ideologies that, placing human beings in the service of history, have denied them a place in the service of their own humanity. Actually, such a totalitarian concept of wholeness stands sharply at odds with what ecologists do not by the term. In addition to comprehending its heightened awareness of form and structure, we now come to an important tenet of ecology. Ecological wholeness is not innumerable. It's good one. It's important. It's good stuff. In addition to comprehending its heightened awareness of form and structure, we now come to a very important tenet of ecology. Ecological wholeness is not an immutable homogeneity, but rather the very opposite, dynamic unity of diversity. In nature, balance and harmony are achieved by ever-changing differentiation, by ever-expanding diversity. Ecological stability, in effect, is a function not of uniformity. It is a function not of simplicity and homogeneity, but of complexity and variety. The capacity of an ecosystem to retain its integrity depends not on the uniformity of the environment, but on its diversity. A striking example of this tenet can be drawn from the experiences of ecological strategies for cultivating food. Farmers have repeatedly met with disastrous results. Farmers have repeatedly met with disastrous results because of the conventional emphasis on a single crop, approaches to agriculture or monoculture 
use a widely accepted term for the endless He used a widely accepted term for these endless wheat and cornfields that extend to the horizon in many parts of the world. Without the mixed crops that normally provide both the countervailing forces and the mutualistic support that come with mixed populations of plants and animals, the entire agricultural situation in an area has been known to collapse. Benign insects become pests because their natural controls, including birds and small mammals, been removed. The soil, lacking earthworms, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, and green manure in sufficient quantities, is reduced to mere sand, a mineral medium for absorbing enormous quantities of inorganic nitrogen salts, which were originally supplied more cyclically and timed more appropriately for crop growth in the ecosystem. In reckless disregard for the complexity of nature, and for the subtle requirements of plant and animal life, the agricultural situation is crudely simplified. Its needs must now be satisfied by a highly soluble synthetic fertilizer. Yeah. Its needs must now be satisfied by highly soluble synthetic fertilizers that percolate into the drinking waters by dangerous pesticides that remain as residues in food. A high standard of food cultivation it was once achieved by diversity of crops and animals, one that was free of lasting toxic agents. And probably more healthful nutritionally, is now barely approximated by single crops whose main supports are, are toxic chemicals and highly simple nutrients. If we assume that the thrust of natural evolution has been toward increasing complexity, that the colonization of the planet by life has been possible only as a result of biotic variety. A prudent rescaling of man's hubris should call for, for caution in disturbing natural processes. These the living things emerging ages ago from their primal aquatic habitat to colonize the most inhospitable areas of the earth have, have created the rich biosphere and now covers it. And it's been possible only because of life's incredible mutability and the enormous legacy of life forms inherited from its long development. Many of these life forms, even the most primal and simplest, Blackfire, welcome in. We're uh, all about that ecology, you know? And what if uh, we didn't destroy the planet? Cause modern farming's uh, kind of messed up. How's that Valheim going? I, I swear if it's not a new cool rhythm game, it's another. Valheim's dead? Rip in peace. So much for that. Don't worry about it. Alright. I've already dropped all the concern. You know what we should be concerned about? Monoculture farming. It's like, yeah man, what if we just uh, take out everything that lives there? Now corn lives there. That isn't great. Where were we? Do, 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 do. Heck. TY though. Just don't worry about me. Alright. I won't. Just because you told me to. The living things emerging ages ago from their primal aquatic habitat to colonize the most inhospitable areas of Earth have created the rich biosphere that now covers it has only been possible has been possible only 
because of life's incredible mutability and the enormous legacy of life forms inherited from its long development. Many of these life forms, even the most primal and simplest, have never disappeared, however much they've been modified by evolution. The simple algal forms that mark the beginnings of plant life and the simple invertebrates that mark the beginnings of animal life still exist in large numbers. They comprise the preconditions for the existence of more complex organic beings, to which they provide sustenance. The sources of decomposition and even the atmospheric oxygen and carbon dioxide. Although they may annotate the higher plants and animals by over a billion years, they interrelate with the more complex descendants in often unravelable ecosystems. To assume that science commands this vast nexus of organic and inorganic interrelationships in all its details is worse than arrogance, it's sheer stupidity. If unity and diversity forms one of the cardinal tenets of ecology, the wealth of biota that exists in a single acre of soil leads us to still another ecological tenet, the need to allow for a high degree of natural spontaneity. The compelling dictum, respect for nature, has concrete implications. To assume that our knowledge of this complex, richly textured, and perpetually changing natural kaleidoscope of life forms lends itself to a degree of mastery that allows us free reign in manipulating the biosphere is sheer foolishness. Thus, a considerable amount of leeway must be permitted for natural spontaneity, for the diverse biological forces that yield a variegated ecological situation. Working with nature requires They mean that we must surrender ourselves to a mythical nature that is beyond all human comprehension and intervention, a nature that demands human awe and subservience. Perhaps the most obvious conclusion we can draw from these ecological tenets is Charles Elton's sensitive observation. The world's future has to be managed. This management would not be just like a game of chess, but more like steering a boat. What ecology, both natural and social, can hope to teach us is the way to find the current and understand the direction of the stream. Yeah, Baker, we're back up to Bookchin. Now with uh, some Sunny Boy tunes over there. I mean, I almost want to go to like just the album art. Maybe that'd be better? So open the kind of new tab if we I just want this image. I just want that image, because it looks so cool. Not well. Oop. I can't full screen both monitors. Yeah. So, to back up to the point where, uh, you can't control nature, man. You just sort of steer it like a boat, drifting gently down the stream. And you're like, whoa, where's that stream going? 
Let's follow it. And what ultimately distinguishes an ecological output? What ultimately distinguishes an ecological outlook as uniquely liberatory is the challenge it raises to conventional notions of hierarchy. Let me emphasize, however, that this challenge is implicit. It must be painstakingly elicited from the discipline of ecology, which is permeated by a conventional scientific ba well, scientific base. That's a way of saying that word. Ecologists are rarely aware that their science provides strong philosophical underpinnings for a non-hierarchical view of reality. Like many natural scientists, they resist philos philosoph philosophical generalizations is alien to their research and conclusions, a prejudice that is itself a philosophy rooted in the Anglo-American empirical tradition. Moreover, they follow their colleagues in other disciplines and model their notions of science on physics. This prejudice, which goes back to Galileo's day, has led to a widespread acceptance of systems theory in ecological circles. While systems theory has its place in the repertoire of science, it can easily become an all-encompassing, quantitative, reductionist theory of energetics if it requires preeminence over qualitative descriptions of ecosystems, that is, descriptions rooted in organic evolution, variety, and holism. Whatever the merits of systems theory as an account of energy flow through an ecosystem, the primacy it gives to this quantitative aspect of ecosystem analysis fails to recognize life forms as more the consumers and producers of calories. Need water. And having presented these caveats, I must emphasize that ecosystems cannot be meaningfully described in hierarchical terms. Whether plant-animal communities actually contain dominant and submissive individuals within a species can be argued at great length. But to rank species within an ecosystem, that is to say, between species, is anthropomorphism at its crudest. As Alison Jolly observed, the notion of animal hierarchies has a checkered history. I still didn't look up this person's name. That's okay, because we can look it up. I want to know how it's pronounced, though. Man. What's pronounced wiki have to say? Can't hear anything over Sunny Boy. Well, that didn't help anything. Chandrup Ebe? I feel like the second E is pronounced. We discovered the pecking order of hens, enlarged his findings to a Teutonic theory of despotism in the universe. For instance, water eroding a stone was dominant. Shigel de Ebb called the animal's ranking dominance, and many research workers, with an aha, recognized dominance hierarchies in many vertebrate groups. 
If we recognize that every ecosystem can be viewed as a food web, we can think of it as a circular, interlacing nexus of plant-animal relationships, rather than a stratified pyramid with man at the apex. That includes such widely varying creatures as microorganisms and large mammals. What ordinarily puzzles anyone who sees food web diagrams for the first time is the impossibility of discerning a point of entry into the nexus. The web can be entered at any point. It leads back to its point of departure without any apparent exit. Aside from the energy provided by sunlight, Anticipation by radiation. The, s the system, to all appearances, is closed. Each species, be it a form of bacteria or a deer, is knitted together in a network of interdependence. However indirect the links may be, a predator in the web is also prey, even if the lowliest organisms merely makes it ill, or helps to consume it after death. Nor is predation the sole link that unites one species with another. A resplendent literature now exists that reveals the enormous extent to which symbiotic mutualism is a major factor in fostering ecological stability and organic evolution. The plants and animals continually adapt to unwittingly aid each other, be it by an exchange of biochemical functions that are mutually beneficial, or even dramatic instances of physical assistance and succor, has opened an entirely new perspective on the nature of ecosystem stability and development. The more complex the food web, the less unstable it will be if one or several species are removed. Hence, enormous significance must be given to the interspecific diversity and complexity within a system as a whole. Striking breakdowns will occur in simple ecosystems, such as arctic and desert ones, say, if wolves that control foraging animal populations are exterminated, or if a sizable number of reptiles that control rodent populations in arid ecosystems are removed. By contrast, great variety of biota that populate temperature and tropical ecosystems can afford losses of carnivores or herbivores without suffering major dislocations. Why do terms borrowed from human social hierarchies acquire such remarkable weight when plant-animal relations are described? Do ecosystems really have a king of the beasts and lowly serfs? Do certain insects enslave others? Does one species exploit another? The promiscuous use of these terms in ecology raises many far-reaching issues. That the terms are laden with socially charged values is almost too obvious to warrant extensive discussion. Many individuals exhibit a pathetic gullibility and the way they deal with nature is a dimension of society. A snarling animal is neither vicious nor savage, nor does it misbehave or earn punishment because it reacts appropriately to certain stimuli. By making such anthropomorphic judgments about natural phenomena, we deny the integrity of nature. Even more sinister is the widespread use of hierarchical terms to provide natural phenomena with intelligibility or order. What this procedure does accomplish is reinforce human social hierarchies by justifying the command of men and women as innate features of the natural order. Human domination is thereby transcribed into the genetic code as biologically immutable, together with the subordination of the young by the old, women by men, and man by man. <laughs> The very promiscuity with which hierarchical terms are used to organize all differentia in nature is inconsistent. A queen bee does not know she is a queen. The primary activity of a beehive is reproductive, and its division of labor, to use a grossly abused phrase, lacks any meaning. 
in a large sexual orgy that performs no authentic economic functions. The purpose of the hive is to create more bees. The honey that animals and people acquire from it is a natural orgasm. Within the ecosystem, bees are adapted more to meeting plant reproductive needs by spreading pollen than to meeting important animal needs. The analogy between a beehive and a society The analogy between a beehive and a society, an analogy a social theorists have often found too irresistible to avoid, is a striking commentary on the extent to which our versions of nature are shaped by self-serving social interests. To deal with so-called insect hierarchies the way we deal with so-called animal hierarchies, or worse, to grossly ignore the very different functions animal communities perform, his analogic reasoning carried to the point of preposterous. Primates relate to each other in ways that often seem to involve dominance and submission for widely separate reasons. Yet termino terminologically and conceptually, they are placed under the same hierarchical rubric as insect societies, despite the different forms they assume and their precarious stability. Baboons on the African savannas have been singled out as the most rigid hierarchical troops in the primate world. But this rigidity evaporates once we examine their once we examine their ranking order in the forest habitat. Even on the savannas, it is questionable whether alpha males rule, control, or coordinate relationships within the troop. Arguments can be presented for choosing any of these words, each of which has a clearly different meaning when used in a human social context. Seemingly patriarchal primate harems can be as loose sexually as brothels, depending on when it is used in a human social context. Depending on whether a female is in estrus, changes have occurred in the habitat, where the patriarch is simply diffident about the whole situation. Baboons, it's worth noting, are monkeys, despite the presumed similarity of their savanna habitat to that of early hominids. They branched off the hominid evolutionary tree more than 20 million years ago. Our closest evolutionary cousins, the great apes, tend to demolish these prejudices about hierarchy completely one of the four great apes, gibbons, have no apparent ranking system at all. Chimpanzees, regarded by most primatologists as the most human-like of all apes, form such fluid kinds of stratification, and depending upon the ecology of the area, which may be significantly affected by research workers, establish such untable, unstable types of association that the word hierarchy becomes an obstacle to understand their behavioral characteristics. Orangutans seem to have little of what could be called dominance and submission relations. The mountain gorilla, despite its formidable reputation, exhibits very little stratification. Yeah, stratification. Except for the predator challenges and internal aggression, all these examples help justify at least Boulding's complaint that the primate behavior model favored by overly hierarchical and patriarchal writers on animal-human parallels is based more on the baboon, not the gibbon. In, concre in contrast to the baboon, observes Boulding, the gibbon is closer to us physically, and one made a on a primate evolutionary scale. Our choice of a primate role model is clearly culturally determined, she concludes. Who wants to be like the unaggressive, vegetarian, food-sharing gibbons, where father is as much involved in child rearing as mother is, 
where everyone lives in small family groups, with little aggregation beyond that. Much better to match the baboons, who live in large, tightly knit groups, carefully closed against outsider baboons, where everyone knows who everyone is. where everyone knows who is in charge, and where mother looks after the babies while father is out hunting and fishing. In fact, Bolden, con Bolden concedes too much about the savannah dwelling primates. Even if the term dominance were stretched to include queen bees and alpha baboons, specific acts of coercion by individual animals can hardly be called domination. Acts do not constitute institutions, episodes do not make a history, and highly structured insect behavioral patterns rooted in instinctual drives are not too inflexible to regard. Highly structured insect behavioral patterns rooted in instinctual drives are too inflexible to be regarded as social. Unless hierarchy is used in Sheldra Ebb's cosmic sense, dominance and submission must be viewed as institutionalized relationships that living things literally institute or create, but which are neither ruthlessly fixed by instinct on the one hand, nor idiosyncratic on the other. By this, I mean that they must comprise a clearly social structure of coerc yeah, coercive and privileged ranks that exist apart from the idiosyncrasy. It's difficult saying words for a period of time. This I mean they must comprise a clearly social structure of coercive and privileged ranks that exists apart from the idiosyncratic individuals who seem to be dominant within a given community, a hierarchy that is guided by a social logic that goes beyond individual interactions or, inborn, or inborn patterns of behavior. Such traits are evident enough in human society when we speak of self-perpetuating bureaucracies and explore them without considering the individual bureaucrats who compose them. Yet, when we turn to non-human primates, what people commonly recognize as hierarchy, status, and domination, are precisely idiosyncratic behaviorisms of individual animals. Mike, Jane, no. Mike and Jane, von Lewick Kodal's alpha chimpanzee acquired his status by rambunctiously charging upon a group of males while noisily hitting two empty kerosene cans, at which point in her narrative, von Lewick Kodal wonders, would Mike become an alpha male without the kerosene cans? She replies that the animal's use of man-made objects is probably The animal's use of man-made objects is probably an indication of superior intelligence. Whether such shadowy distinctions in intelligence, rather than aggressiveness, willfulness, or arrogance, produce an alpha male, is not, or not, is evidence more of the subtle projection of historically conditioned human values in a primate group than the scientific objectivity that that ethology likes to claim for itself. Okay. Mm. I almost would be like we need some sort of break every now and again. I suppose we can, at the very least, maybe play this. Probably not, I suppose. Come on. Oh. The seemingly hierarchical traits of many animals 
are more like variations in the links of a chain than organized stratifications we find in human societies and institutions. Even the so-called class societies of the Northwest Indians, as we shall see, are chain-like links between individuals rather than class-like links between strata and early that early Euro-American invaders so naively projected on Indians from their own social world. If acts do not constitute institutions and episodes do not constitute history, individual behavioral traits do not form strata or classes. Social strata are made of sterner stuff. They live a life of their own apart from the personalities who give them substance. How is ecology to devoid? How is ecology to devoid? Me. Me. How is ecology to avoid the analogic reasoning that has made so much of pathology and sociobiology seem like spacious projections of human society into nature? I wonder. Yeah, we can just do that. terms that provide a common meaning to unity and diversity, natural spontaneity, and non-hierarchical relationship in nature and society. In view of the many tenets that appear in natural ecology, why stop with these alone? Why not introduce another, perhaps less savory, ecological notions like predation and aggression into society? In fact, Nearly all of these questions became major issues in social theory in the early part of the century, when the so-called Chicago physi physiology of the city, Robert Park, Ernst Burgess, and Roderick McKenzie, enamored of the new science, actually imposed a stringent biological model of their studies on their studies of Chicago with a forcefulness and inspiration that dominated American urban sociology for two generations. Their tenets included ecological succession, spatial distribution, zonal distribution, anab anabolic-catabolic balances, and even competition and natural selection. They could have easily pushed the school towards the insidious form of social Darwinism had it not been for the liberal biases of its founders. Despite its admirable, despite its admirable empirical results, the school was to founder on its metaphorical reductionism. Applied indiscriminately, the categories ceased to be meaningful. When Park compared the emergence of a certain specialized municipal utilities to successional dominance by other plant species that climaxes in the beech or pine forest, the analogy was patently forced and absurdly contorted. His comparison of ethnic, cultural, occupational, and economic groups to plant invasions revealed the lack of theological theoretical discrimination that reduced human social features to plant ecological features. What Park and his associates lacked was the philosophical equipment for sticking out the phrases that both unite and separate natural and social phenomena in the developmental con continuum. Thus, merely superficial similarity became outright identity the unfortunate result that social ecology was repeatedly reduced to natural with the unfortunate result the social ecology was repeatedly reduced to natural ecology the richly mediated evolution of the nature into the social 
could have been used to yield a meaningful selection of ecological categories. It was not part of the school's theoretical equipment. However, we ignore the way social hum we ignore the way human social relationships transcend plant animal relationships. Our views tends to bifurcate in two erroneous directions. Either we succumb to the heavy handed dualism that harshly separates the natural from the social, or we fall into a crude reductionist reduction yeah reductionism that dissolves the one into the other. In either case, we really cease to think out the issues involved. We merely grasp for the least uncomfortable solution to a highly complex problem. Namely, the need to analyze the phases through which mute biological nature increasingly becomes conscious human nature. What makes unity and diversity in nature more than a suggestive ecological metaphor for unity and diversity in society is the underlying philosophical concept of wholeness. By wholeness, I mean varying levels of actualization and unfolding of the wealth of particularities that are latent in a yet What in the gosh darn? Hello, Skeevy Bath. Uh, this old man wrote a book. It's like, hey, do you know we uh, actually don't have to destroy the planet? And uh, queen bees aren't really queens. Stop calling them that. They, they, they don't rule things. That's not how it works. And uh, I hope you don't mind of using your mu music as the backtracking because, you know, you make good music. We even go back to Love Junkie. Cause that's some good shit. I uh, didn't listen to it on release date, but we'll. Yas, Queen. The inverse. We're saying that Queen B. <laughs> How dare you say such a thing to me? The music's good. It's very good. I, uh. Frankly? It's sex incarnate. I'd go so far as to say it's your tunes. Oh dear sonny boy. Could be better than the anarchist writings of Murray Bookchin. Which, I don't know, like, I don't want to make fun of their name because it has book in it and they wrote a book, but like that just seems on brand. You love to see it. I will not stand for this, which is why I'm laying down. Alright. Don't don't bust it not moving too quickly, you know. You know how it goes. Lay down, relax, take it easy. Take a load off. Cool my load. Whatever you need to do. Please no TMCA Papa Skeebs. My <laughs> My black hole can't handle going to prison. Is that the man Murray Bookchin? Yeah, that's him. Cause he wrote this book in like the uh, 50s and died like 15 years ago. He lived a full life like a modern philosopher. Crazy. Probably a good person. I don't know. He at least wrote good things. Here, I don't know. Shoot. What if I... Cause I know... Yikes. Those words are a little dark. What if we do that? And here's a font that's not Arial. I feel like it's still a little... Oh well. Oh well. He looks too polite to be pissed off on stuff. Yeah, man. It, it turns out you don't have to burn down federal buildings 
to say, hey, you should probably stop shooting black people and destroying the planet. You can also just be a quiet old man and be like, hey, you know what's really going down? It's pretty messed up to go like, alpha baboons are the alpha. Because, uh, I think they are. I think Jane Goodall's chimpanzee Mike. Like, well, he keeps rattling those kerosene cans. That makes them the alpha. But what if we never gave them the kerosene cans? Would they still be the alpha if we weren't even here to observe them? What's the quantum state of that chimpanzee? Jo what makes unity and diversity in nature more than a suggestive ecological metaphor for unity and diversity in society is the, is the underlying philosophical concept of wholeness. By wholeness, I mean varying levels of actualization and unfolding of the wealth of particularities that are latent in a as yet undeveloped potentiality. This potentiality may be a newly planted seed a newly born infant, a newly born community, or a newly born society. When Hegel describes in his famous passage of the unfolding of human knowledge in biological terms, the fit is almost exact. The bud disappears in the bursting forth of the blossom, and one may say the former is, refu is refuted by the latter. Similarly, when the fruit appears, the blossom has shown up in its turn as a false manifestation of the plant. The fruit now emerges as the truth of it instead. These forms are not just distinguished from one another. They also supplant one another as truly incompatible. Yet at the same time, their fluid nature makes them moments of an organic unity in which they not only do not conflict, but in which each is as necessary as the other, and this mutual necessity alone constitutes the life of the whole. I have turned to this remarkable passage because Hegel does not mean it to be merely metaphoric. His biological example is a social subject matter converge in ways that transcend both, notably the similar aspects of a larger process life itself, as distinguished from the non-living, emerges from the inorganic latent with all the particularities that is eminently produced from the logic of its most nascent forms of self-organization. So do society, as distinguished from biology, humanity as distinguished from animality, and individuality as distinguished from humanity. It is no spiteful manipulation of Hegel's famous maxim, the true is the whole, to declare that the whole is the true. One can take this reversal of terms to mean that the true lies in the self-consummation of a process through its development, in the flowering of its latent particularities, into the fullness or wholeness just as the potentialities of a child achieve expression in the wealth of experiences and the physical growth that enter into adulthood. Man. Lighting. Ah well. We must not get caught up in the direct comparisons between plants, animals, and the human beings, or between animal-plant ecosystems and human communities. None of these is completely congruent with another. We would be regressing in our views to those of Park, Burgess, and Mackenzie, not to mention our current bouquet of sociobiologists, where we lack enough to make this equation. It is not in the particulars of differentiation that plant-animal communities are ecologically united with human communities, rather in the 
logic of differentiation, wholeness is in fact completeness. The dynamic stability of the whole derives from a visible level of completeness in human communities as in climax ecosystems. What unites these models of wholeness and completeness, however different they are in the same unifying process, the same dialectic, that a particular social form is whole and complete. When wholeness and completeness are viewed as a result of an imminent dialectic within phenomena, we do no more violence to the uniqueness of these phenomena than the principle of gravity does violence to the uniqueness of objects that fall within its lawfulness. In this sense, the idea of human roundedness, a product of the rounded community, is the legitimate heir to the ideal of a stabilized nature, a product of the rounded natural environment. Marx tried to root humanity's identity in self-discovery and its productive interaction with nature. But I must add that not only does humanity place its imprint in the natural world and transform it, but also, natu- but also nature places its imprint in the human world and transforms it. To use the language... <laughs> This is just the opposite of Sam Jackson screaming at you? Excellent, I'm glad. I I mean, unless you enjoy Samuel Jackson screaming motherfucker at you, and I don't do that so you don't like it, I can... go find a loop of me shouting smegma. That's entertainment. Smegma. Dang. Dang some thought ads. I won't subject I won't subject you to that. Bunch of realtors wanna sell me a house, but they like, hey, you have no money. Can't believe them. Hey man, don't diss the smack. I literally fill my stream around one joke. It's a good joke. It's a good Way to be. Smegma's quality, right? It's gotta be. Like, if it wasn't quality entertainment, people wouldn't come to watch it. It'd be like, wow, look at that dick cheese. Like, I ain't out there making some Smegma butter sandwiches, but. Another banger from Sunny Boy. Oh no, I did that thing again. Right, there's all my monitors, the full screen windows. Smeg was good shit. You know what else is pretty good? Can I? I can't. Because your music's back. Understanding. The unity between human society and the natural world. To use the language of hierarchy against itself, it is not only we who tame nature, but also nature who tames us. You know, sometimes you milk the man, sometimes the man milks you. It's a goes both ways. These turns of phrase should be taken as more than metaphors. In an, the United Smeg Association, shading light on dick cheese for at least a year. Do it. Form an advocacy group. Just go around being like, hey, Smegma, which you have been. So long as you're not, you know, advocating for uh, unclean penises, because I love smegma. 
but I'm only sucking clean dicks. So that's some give and take, you know. Ain't slurping on no feminine penises that ain't clean. And does it? <laughs> Do it. Form a super pack with all your Twitch cash. Turn those Bezos bucks into something useful. Pragmatic, even. And these turns of phrase should be taken as more than metaphors. Let's just say I have verified the concept of wholeness into an abstract dialectical principle. Let me note that natural ecosystems and human communities interact with each other in a very existential ways. Our animal nature is never so distant from our social nature that we can remove ourselves from the organic world outside us and the one within us. From our embryonic development to our layered brain, we partly recapitulate our own natural evolution. We are not so remote from our primate ancestry that we can ignore its physical legacy in our stereoscopic vision. Acuity of intelligence and grasping fingers. We phase into society as individuals the same way that society, phasing out of nature, comes into itself. These continuities, to be sure, are obvious enough. What is often less obvious is the extent to which nature itself is a realm of potentiality for the emergence of social differentia. Nature is as much a precondition for the development of society, not merely its emergence, as techniques, labor, language, and mind. And it is a precondition, not merely in William Petty's sense, that if labor is the father of wealth, nature is its mother. This formula, so dear to Marx, actually slights nature by imparting to it the patriarchal notion of feminine passivity. The affinities between nature and society are more active than we care to admit. Very specific forms of nature, very specific ecosystems, constitute the ground for very specific forms of society. At the risk of highly battle phrase, I may say that a historical materialism of natural development could be written that would transform passive nature, the object of human labor, to active nature, the creator of human labor. Labor's metabolism with nature cuts both ways, so that nature interacts with humanity to yield the actualization of their common potentialities in the natural and social worlds. So just keep talking and keep talking. It uh, actually does dry out your throat. I haven't spoken at length for this period of time. That's a drop. Penis. Penis. Just straight up penis. Penis? Male genitalia. Smack mouth. Or is it penguins? Like those birds. Those are good birds. It's not birds. It better be a feminine penis. I ain't, <laughs> ain't sucking no dude stick. That's gay. An interaction of this kind 
in which terms like father and mother strike a false note can be stated very concretely. The recent emphasis on bioregions frameworks. A bright red room. Look, I'm all about the accumulation of smegma as much as the next guy, but uh, a bright a bright red urethra sounds like some sort of urinary tract infection. Like, you mean like, ch like chair red or like cause that's that's not great. That's uh, sounds downright painful, an indication of inflammation. That's not where you want to be. That's not it. I mean, wait. Heck. It's been like weeks, but Judd killed me the other day. And he's like... If you think I'm coming without a metal rod shoved in my urethra, you're out of your freaking mind. I don't know if I'll ever find it again. Can we find it again? From... It's not even... God dang it, Chuds. I'm losing my mind. Of course. He's not... What the heck? Just blind. Looks like. No, oh, I can't spell because it's. Do you mind Discord? I'm trying to use you. Diddly dang. Discord clients need to be updated. I ain't gonna do that. Uh, can't turn my urethra bright red. I don't dare risk it. I'll celebrate State Farms alright. How does one cool without a sounding rod within? Wouldn't act as a pl I mean, that's uh, the appeal of a metal rod shoved up your ure urethra. It's like sounding, but with none of the commitment. You can. Like sounding, but none of the commitment. You can sound all by your lonesome. You don't need a second penis. Bitch. There's the infamous double dick dude, but surely that's just a urban legend. There's no way one man could possibly have a second penis. I just, I assume the sounding rod just sort of pops out like a red rocket. Although I uh, haven't tried. There are barriers and cum signs that need to be broken. Smegma yet to be licked. I'm gonna try reading this book with a serious tone again, but uh, don't stop thinking about dick and balls. <laughs> Make sure you have the old glory at the end of the rod. That's true. We ain't it ain't waving a flag. What are you even doing? Where's my man? Well, I got this flag. That's technically more of a symbol than a flag. We can make uh, it's backwards because I flipped it, but we can make America green again because it's it's green, like ecological. 
I almost want a flag, but at the same time I have no property to hang out. Old glory. You know? Like, where am I gonna put the stars and bars? Better idea. I'm trying to buy property. Why don't I just go put confederate flags on them? People throw brick th bricks through the windows. Drop the property value. I can buy it. And then, uh... Take the flags down. It's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Maybe fraud. Potentially fraud? It's probably not fraud. Um, some big brain stonks look trapped in this fading pixelated library gives you a lot of time to think about things gives you a lot of ability to scheme I don't know because I made this blender last week and I think it looks neat so I'm going to pop off like, look at that chair. Isn't that a nice chair? Wouldn't you want to curl up in this reading room? That well. The recent emphasis on bioregions as frameworks for various human communities provides a strong case. The chair looks like it's made out of human skin. Alright, because the idea... Can I shoot? The idea was to make like a thinking chair. Because <laughs> someone's like, yeah. Big red. I, I couldn't do the little spirally arms, but you know what I mean. Maybe it is. Maybe we can. I mean. We have the technology. Yeah, yeah. It's not like we don't have the technology to change the color. No. Oh. And I have to move everything over. What would be a better color? the skeeviest of baths. Cause I do want to like add the lamp to the scene too. It's a good lamp. Uh we are in object mode. I believe it's this cube. And everything else inherits the materials from it. Just material true. What's better? I don't know if I can do blue, because then it'll just go to the blue screen. Oh, nice. Shout out to Eldritch Ships. Yeah. Good guys. Great company. They probably do things. I don't know. I managed to make a game technically work before going, wow. I don't actually want to make a game like this. I think I'd rather do like lighter web-based games. But good news, we technically can model. We just I don't know how that baby blue would look. Actually, it doesn't look bad. Baby blue's presentable. You gotta find that sweet spot of clicker addiction for the monkey brain masses. That's it. I think there's 
There's no reason I can't make a cookie clicker. There's no reason we can't. Heck, it'd be better than a cookie clicker. Because we can make assets like this. Ooh, not that green though. Like, I don't want to do brown or orange because that just kind of looks like shit. It doesn't look like leather without more nudes. Kind of like a lavender. Uh, and where's the camera if I render this? The heck is the camera, 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 camera? Where is that camera? Did I? It's right there. So if we render a single frame. Got it. We could use this. This is fine. This is decent. Uh, sure. I'll get there. So I, I feel like a cookie cooker clone wouldn't be terribly difficult to create. It's you. You are the image I seek. Let's not just throw my downloads folder up there. That's a dangerous situation. My but I was definitely in danger. Right. Do a re structure and zoom in. Like, uh, what if the sizing is not stretch? It's just fit. Oop. Actually, move me out. Because I think I want it cropped realistically. Just stretching it out. Kinda works. Enough. I think Oh that's a little high. There. It's less flesh colored so more to your liking of the knob mm. it's a little high so it doesn't look like I'm sitting in it that's fine that's fine sometimes it's how it be where nowhere oh right so it's this tab Back to there, back there. Keep Blender running in the background. So, of course, we do. Coggers in the librarium. That's the idea. Have a cozy little reading room. Also, your music's back. The ads are gone. Those dirty, dirty SoundCloud ads. Trying to make money off your hard work. I think next on the uh, list of blender things to learn is how to make fabric look like fabric. Because those are just uh, shapes. Bam. Cool cat. Is that you, the cool cat? The cat is cool. So I say, my kitten's asleep. Wherever she is. There she is. You can't see anything because it's all blocked out. But I assure you, there's a cat. 
how you can go so far. Just turn off the chroma key. Be like, bam. Okay. Can I not hold this sideways? And I inverted everything. How far? That's how close I can get to the kit. Huh? Before we lose everything again. What a good cat. I think you can add textures. Yeah, somehow make it come back. Focus. There's definitely a way to make it more fabricy. But uh I haven't tried. So that's where that stands. Cause there's like entire feature length films animated in Blender. Blender's a good tool, probably. So long as I can use it. Because it's substance painter is what. Shoot. Go full screen on me, I'm trying to read. Substance painter. Yeah. But it's. I believe Substance Painter is a. Not free to use. But I don't know offhand. True, because it's powerful paint engines, smart materials. That's what we're looking for. Those materials, multi platforms, visual effects. Yeah. It's industri industry standards. Look, you can even use it with Unity. Maya. I've never seen Moto before in my life. People use substance. Yeah. Free to try. I ain't made of money. Just use Blender nodes. It's like, there's no reason you can't. No reason you can't just use Blender nodes. Now, man. Where were we? Right. It's like you can't. Can't call Mother Nature mommy nature because that's that's weird. Nature's not your mother. It's a just sort of a state, a status, an omnipresent force. It's also passive because it's just there. Like nature's got no agenda. requirements and possibilities place a heavy burden on humanity's claims of sovereignty over nature and autonomy from its needs. If it's true that men make history, but not under conditions of their own choosing, Mars, it is no less true that history makes society, but not under conditions of its own choosing, the hidden dimension that lurks in this wordplay with Mark's famous formula. It's the natural history that enters into the making of social history. But as active, concrete, existential nature that emerges from stage to stage of its own ever more complex develop development in the form of equally complex and dynamic ecosystems, our ecosystems in turn, are interlinked in highly dynamic and complex bioregions. How concrete the hidden dimension of social development is, and how much humanity's claims to sovereignty must defer to it, has only recently become evident from our need to design an alternate 
has only recently become evident from our need to design an alternative technology that is as adaptive to a bioregion as it is productive to society. Hence, our concept of wholeness is not a satisfied tapestry of natural and social relations that we can exhibit to the hungry eyes of sociologists. It is a fecund natural history, ever active and ever changing, the way childhood presses toward and is absorbed into youth and youth into adulthood. Oh, because I think it's been a hot second. Shoot. That the I'm gonna bully you with the last thing that I put out. Hey, it's still downloaded on this machine. That's nice. So I feel like it's gonna take up that monitor. Assuming you still exist. Oh. Monkey man. Take me by the hand. To the. Gotta save the queen, it's the other monitor. <laughs> it is the full screen. Uh oh. So we got spooters that spawn, and you can shoot them, and maybe the border is a little extreme. It crops off some of the words. But you can run around and shoot them dead, and pick up a little health, and oh no! There's new spiders, because you killed them all. And the audio cuts out. For some reason. I, I don't know. And these were uh, not my assets. Certainly, something. Look at him go. Yeah, the attorney isn't great. with it for far too long and it didn't even make it better that's not great well time to go die in the desert I only added the death animation if uh -huh. you killed by a spider. That's uh that's an oversight. That's certainly an oversight.
put a tune. Because um, our ecosystems in turn. No Scabious Advance. I'm not feeling it. I don't know if it's just the rainfall or uh dude. just the depression. But I think it's as good a time as any to go raid shoot. I can't spell. No, they're not even there. Cause you're there. We'll just go read them. Unless they're not even there. Zoom. One, three, two. Cause we'll get out of here. Yeah. 